Luther, the, the very day that God changed my perspective about BU. You know, women's conferences get guest speakers in and I've watched people go, you know, and particularly now I'm in the States, people, you hear conversations, oh, so-and-so's going to speak at that one. I'm going there, I'm going here and, and then they're here in September, so I'm going over to here. And you realise people are smorgasbording what they feed themselves according to how famous the person is that's coming to speak. And I remember, you know, feeling the pressure, who do I get to come and speak at BU? God, I prayed into every conference. I pray over this conference all year, literally all year. And in my spirit, I'm just saying, God, what do you want to say to your people? And, and then sometimes I would invite people and they would, they would speak the same message. They preached at four or five different places and they wouldn't speak into what I felt God was saying. And it would just... Uh, it was a cause of frustration to me, but I also would be like, who do I get? Who do I get? And I will never forget one uh, year, God just whispering in, in my spirit and saying, Jane, when will you let me be the guest speaker at your conference? And it was like, and I remember going to Pastor Ashley and he said, absolutely. I've been telling you that for years. <laughs> like, oh, Sorry for not listening. Um, but you know, God is the guest speaker at BU. It is not about a person. It is not about a personality. It is not about anything else other than you coming into the room like Danielle did last year at conference and hearing a word from God and getting down off this stage and being set free from abandonment that she had carried since she was a little child. And I just believe and know, it's not even a hope, it is I know God is gonna set women free. I had a vision that women came to the altar call and, and I looked down and they had uh, zip ties on their hands and they were standing there and God, just went down the line and snipped those zip ties off and set women free right across this place. And I wanna just challenge you, if you haven't registered, you know, sometimes we put a cost on it and I know that $90 is the registration cost now. Um, and that includes lunch and a whole load of amazing things that are gonna happen at conference. But I know sometimes we say that's, you know, beyond my reach, but I believe in faith. If you believe in faith, God will provide for you. And I just, I wanna challenge you, not, not because I'm speaking, not because there are other people speaking, Pastor Shana and other people speaking at this conference that I believe God has spoken to me and said, you will get them to speak. And I know God wants to speak to you. This is about God giving you a word that changes your life forever, giving you a dream. Some people in this place have stopped dreaming. You used to have a dream, you've lived the dream, you stopped dreaming for whatever reason. And God God wants to reawaken the dreamer in you. There are people here that don't know what a dream from God looks like and that's okay because God wants to deposit a dream in your heart. You haven't lived a God dream yet. And God's saying, come on, I can't wait to get started. I wanna give you a dream that will give you guidance that you walk into your future with a sense of purpose, knowing what you were put on this planet for. And so can I encourage you to be in the room? You know, I remember last year, no, well, I think it was actually this year, standing, I can't remember when it was, but one of the last times I was here standing on this platform and the youth camp was being, um, 
being advertised. And I remember just getting such a passion in my heart when I got up to preach. I, I began to say, you've got to send your kids to youth camp. You need to send your kids to youth camp. It's where God spoke to my life. It's where God touched my life. I can't even remember what the speaker was. It didn't matter because God was there and God met me at the altar. And I remember just saying, come on, send your kids to youth camp. Do it. Put them in a place where they can hear from God. And right in the middle of me saying that, there was like a train thought came through my mind that I've learned to recognise as the Holy Spirit. And He said, send Ben to youth camp. Now it's the middle of summer, he's on summer break from college and I, I even spoke it out. I don't know if you can remember, but I spoke it out. I said, I think the Holy Spirit's just told me to send Ben to youth camp. Because sometimes, you know, I think and speak. It doesn't really go anywhere else. It just comes straight out of my mouth. But I, it, a lot had to happen for that to take place. I had to get it past Pastor Ashley, who really was responsible for paying his airfare. Now, an airfare to America, uh, to Australia from America is not um, cheap. <laughs> and we didn't have that money just sitting in our back pockets. So I'm like, I'm going to have to um, get this past Pastor Ashley. And then what's Ben going to say? He's 20 years old. He's not youth age anymore. He doesn't know half of the youth leaders. He's never met them. They don't know him. He's not going to feel comfortable. But anyway, I went home with that word in my spirit. And I talked to Pastor Ashley and he said, you know what? I think that's God. I'm going to shift this, move this. And he made a way to pay for Ben to come to youth camp. And then I had to get it past Ben. And I was like, you know, you don't tell your 20-year-old son, um, I, God has spoken to me, you are going to youth camp. It just does not work with the pastor's kids. So you just have to kind of casually, you know, hey, I was thinking, what do you think about, I knew, you know, I know it's the middle of summer and Adelaide's cold at this time of the year, but what, what I, th I really think maybe just possibly, what do you think about going to youth camp this year in Australia? And, uh, you know, you just hope to sort of slip it in and they say yes distractedly while they're on their phone and then you're, you've got them. So it pretty much, Ben just kind of looked away. He looked back and he goes, you know, I think I'm meant to go. That in itself is a miracle from God. And we said to him, and I want to tell you, he was baptised in the Holy Spirit at youth camp. His life was changed. He was meant to stay one week. He ended up staying three weeks. He feels that God has spoken to him just maybe that he will come back after he's finished his degree to do an internship. So you better still be around by then. And <laughs> who knows? But God changed his life forever. And what am I saying all this for? I'm saying that God wants to speak by His Holy Spirit into your life, into your life, into your life, your life, your life, your life, your life, every single person's life in this room. We are going into a time across this world where the world needs a church that is potent, that needs a church that hears from God. You know, I was on my way to, from Atlanta to Los Angeles to catch my flight to Sydney, to catch my flight to Adelaide, to be here. And the flight from Atlanta to Los Angeles is four hours and something minutes, nearly five hours. It's a terrible flight. And that's the flight I work on when I'm coming this way. That's the flight I work on because I'm too exhausted because then it's in through the middle of the night, if that makes sense, the rest of the flight. So I decided I'm working on this flight. I took my iPad out of my overhead baggage, put it on the seat behind me. I sat in my seat. There was a very tall, distinguished Southern gentleman sitting in the window seat. And our first interaction was him saying, would you mind if we swapped seats? And I... <laughs> I just looked at him and I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, you will not want to swap seats with me. I am a frequent visitor to the bathroom. 
and you don't want me climbing over you. He was a little bit, um, he was sure that his charm and everything was going to work. And I'm like, nope. I felt terrible later, and you'll understand why. Anyway, so that was our first interaction. He was like, <laughs> anyway, he wasn't terribly thrilled that I didn't succumb to his charm. And uh, I, he does not know Pass Ashley, and I've resisted his charm many times. So, <laughs> anyway, I was <laughs> sitting in the seat, and before we even took off. I was, you know, getting my stuff sorted and putting my seatbelt on and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, this is an important man. He is in politics. He also likes to sing. I have no idea what the relevance of that was. Maybe it was important fact that I wouldn't know about his life if I knew who he was, which I didn't, if that makes sense. Anyway, this man is an important man. He's in politics. He likes to sing. And he has a call of God on his life that he is running away from because there have been seeds of intercessory prayer sown into his life that I am requiring a harvest of from him. Word for word. That's what the Holy Spirit said to me. I'm like, dang, there goes my work. <laughs> Anyway, I just tapped him on the arm. He was looking out of the window and I said, hey, you are very important. <laughs> That's a really good way to get people's attention. You're in politics and you also like to sing. And I began to just tell him simply what the Holy Spirit had told me. He looked in my face and he said, who are you? And I said, oh, I am a pastor disguised as a white 60-year-old lady. <laughs> he was like, his demeanor immediately changed. He started to cry and cry. And he said, you can run, but you cannot hide from God. He said, last night I called out to God to take, like he said, I'm in a, a, a difficult place. And he started to just unpack his life story for the next three hours. We talked. I began to just speak to him like I would speak to one of my sons, except he was older than me. Um, I, I began to speak into his life about the call of God and the sacrifice God was asking for him and about strength and about the Holy Spirit being his partner and all of these things. And he just literally held onto my hands and wept. And we ended up praying together, crying together for the next three hours. He was on his way to Sydney to speak at a very significant political conference. That man knows two ex-presidents of the United States. That man has great influence. He has been res resided over appointing judges to the courts. He has great influence and God knew that he needed to hear from him. You see, church, the, church, the world needs a church that is sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. There are people all over your life. There are people in the supermarkets, people living next door to you, people at school, people in your families that need to hear what God is saying to them. They need to hear the messages that God is trying to get through to them and God chooses to limit His partnership with us by us, through us. We are the only ones that people will listen to. When God has a message in heaven for people around us, He's tapping us on the shoulder and saying, will you tell them this for me? And the only way we can do that is if we become sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You see, this whole message is, is just really a prophetic word that God spoke to me uh, about 10 days ago, I was 
trying to sleep. I was lying in bed at night. The lights were off. And as I'm trying to get myself in sleep mode, the Holy Spirit spoke these words to me. He said, there has been a shaking in my church. And I'm talking about the church worldwide now. Globally, he said, There's been a shaking in my church that came with COVID, but it happened, it started to happen before that. That shaking brought authenticity of faith because what happened was churches were shut down. And I know that we think the devil did that and it was evil. And I, yes, I believe COVID was evil. And I do believe it was a plan of the enemy, but God knew what was happening and He used it to shake His church to bring an authenticity to our faith. Could we survive without meeting together in this building? What was our faith gonna look like when it was clothed in fear? Would it still be there tomorrow? Would it still be there in months? And you and I both know people who have not come back to church after COVID. The church is open, but their hearts have shut. There was a shaking that brought an authenticity of faith to those that refused to be shaken. And then almost simultaneously, there was a sifting, a sifting of God's church that brought a purity. And many people, we saw people in leadership, but also just normal Christians that that did not respond to the constant opportunities of grace that God gave them to clean up their lives, to change things around. And they walked away. And and when God's grace was chasing after them, they chose to walk their own way. And that sifting brought a purity to those that would listen and others chose not to. And God said there was a shaking that brought authenticity. There's a sifting that brought purity. But now I'm doing a new thing. I'm taking my church through transition that is gonna bring a sensitivity of the Holy Spirit that will bring potency. And that's what my message is about, church, this morning. That God wants to bring to you and I a sensitivity to the voice of the Holy Spirit so that we become the potent church that He needs us to be to touch the world around us. Because in these last days, the Bible says in Joel, in Joel 22, 28, it will come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. This is not a move in the church that is about leadership. This is not a move in the church that is about um, pastors or the front row. This is not a move in the church that is about the musicians or singers. This is a move in the church that God wants to do to pour out His Spirit on all flesh. That means all of you, all of us, nobody left out. And here's the passion and cry of my heart. I felt like God said, will you speak this word to my church so that they're ready, so nobody misses out because it's God's desire that He pours it out on all flesh. But I've been in moves of God before where people stood in meetings where the power of God was so tangible, so heavy. Others were falling to the ground. People were weeping. People were just lost in the presence of God. And I watched people in those meetings stand like this and completely miss what God was doing. And I feel like God is saying, I'm transitioning my church to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit so that when I bring a move of my Spirit on all flesh, they will be ready. They will be waiting. They will be listening. They'll have their eyes wide open. He says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions and also on my main servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, says the Lord. 
And at church, I feel as your mother, your spiritual mother, I feel so passionate about saying, God wants me to prepare you. God wants us to be prepared together. It isn't about me. This is not a move of personality driven uh, from the stage kind of prophetic whatever. It is a move of God that He is gonna pour out on all flesh. It is gonna be a move of God where He wants you to hear from His Spirit and speak life into that child of yours that's gone astray. He, it's a move of His Spirit that He wants you to hear from the voice of God to pray for that friend who's just had a, a diagnosis of a terminal illness. It's a move of God that God wants you to speak life into someone who is gripped by depression. It's a move of God that God wants you to lead someone to the Lord in the grocery aisle and not care who's looking, not care who's listening, but understanding that a sensitivity to the voice of the Holy Spirit brings potency, a potency to His church that He is desperately seeking so that He can pour out His Spirit on all flesh. He's getting ready. He's creating a hunger. And I know I watch every Saturday pretty much online these services here because your family, and I know Jermaine is probably watching or does the earlier service, and Pastor Nancy, they watch too. We're all online together and, and I've seen and I've felt through the miles, the waves of God's Spirit that have been present in this room. And what happens is God sends a wave of His Spirit. You know what He does? The wave comes in and then it goes back. And then it comes in and then it goes back. What's He doing? Why does He withdraw? You know what it is? It's to produce a hunger inside of us for more. He's drawing us every time that wave comes get wet, <laughs> but then when it goes back, follow the wave. God wants you to follow, not go, oh, that was nice. God wants you to follow after Him. He wants you to become hungry and sensitive. So this is a Scripture God gave me for this message. At first I was like, what? It's a little random, but I, I wanna unpack a little bit of it. Philippians 3:12. Not that I have already ob obtained it, this goal of being Christ-like, or have already been made perfect, but I actively press on so that I may take hold of that perfection for which Christ Jesus took hold of me and made me His own. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I've made it my own yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the heavenly prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature, pursuing spiritual perfection, should have this attitude and if any respect, you have a different attitude, that too God will make clear to you. I love that. You see, the Holy Spirit is not a formula or a style. We may have experienced something before, a touch of the Holy Spirit. We may have got radically saved. We may have experienced God in our own way, in a very personal way. But I wanna tell you that the Holy Spirit is saying, I'm doing a new thing. You have to forget what lies behind. You have to forget the past. And it's not a erasing of menu, a memory. <laughs> Otherwise, all the men and all women would be the most spiritual people in the church, it is, that was a joke, you'll catch it, but what it is, what God wants to do, He wants us to not pay attention to the past and look towards the past to bring the past back. He's saying, 
there's so much more better stuff in the future than anything that happened in the past. And some of us, He wants you to let go of bad things in the past that are stopping you looking forward and reaching towards what God has you in the future. For some of you, you need to just let go. All of us need to let go. We need to let go of good things. We need to let go of how we think God is going to work. We need to let go of bad things that have happened in our past that we think discount us from hearing from God in the future. We need to let go of failures. I feel so strongly there are people in this room who have have failed and you know you're like God will not forgive me that is a lie from the pit of hell from the enemy of your soul and he wants to set you free from that this morning he wants you to let it go because God said his grace is sufficient for you his strength is made perfect in your weakness he understands your humanity and he says there's so much more for you let it go let it go Are you ready? Are you ready for a move? You know, God showed me, sorry, I have to take this off. That's better. God showed me a rocket ship. You know what happens with a rocket ship? It has boosters on it. And when they send that rocket ship up, those boosters are needed to fight through the gravity. But it gets to a certain place. Once those boosters have done their job, they they fall off and God is wanting you and I to let go of things that once were good, that once had got us to a certain place. He's saying it's time to let go. Stop holding on to those things. It's going to slow you down for where I want to take you. We've got to let go. So how do we press on? How do we reach forward? First, I said we have to forget. I've covered that. And the second thing, is we need to reach forward. We need to reach for more. There's capacity in that. For me, when I, when I hear reaching forward, it's like, I don't even know. Like God doesn't do anything twice the same way. Have you noticed that? In the Bible, it's really hard to, under, to find God doing the same thing twice. Why? Because He knows We do it once and we make a formula out of it. And we think this is how God works and we put Him in a box and God says, I will not be put in anybody's box. And so we have to reach forward and we have to create a capacity inside of us for more, a capacity that the Holy Spirit can fill. And Pastor Ashley and I have been talking about this over the last few weeks and One of the things that is happening, a movement, if you like, that's happening in Atlanta and in in our campuses over there is a movement of prayer. Because what we've decided and what we know to be true in our own lives that sometimes our prayer is really ineffective. We may sit with God for 10 minutes, half an hour, whatever it is, and then we read our Bible and we think, wow, I've spent time with God this morning. But the truth is that most of that time is ineffective because we don't know how to pray. We don't know how to pray effective prayers. And we just haven't ever really been taught. We're just like prayer is talking to God. And so I'm going to teach you the three stages of prayer really quickly. That first stage where you come to God. And these, the first stage is not bad. The second stage is not bad. The third stage is certainly not bad. But it's, it's the transition. It's the process you go through to get to great faith praying. You see, Jesus, even in the Bible, described people's faith. <clears throat> he said, you have no faith to some people. Shocking. You have little faith and you have great faith. You see, Jesus graded people's faith. The disciples watched Jesus pray. They had learned how to pray as Jewish boys since they were old enough to speak. They knew how to pray. They prayed how the people in the synagogue prayed. But they watched Jesus pray and they saw results from His prayers and they said what? Teach us how to pray. 
So I want to teach you how to pray because we cannot be sensitive to the Holy Spirit with praying, complaining, no faith prayers because that's how I describe it. When I come to God, Um, at the the first stage of my prayer, there's a mountain in front of me and it's the mountain of obstacle of my circumstance. It's it's an annoyance with my husband, very rarely ever. Um, I don't know why I said that one first. That's terrible. I know he's gone to sleep though, so he's not watching, as he told me. That's good. It could be an annoyance with my kids. It could be a circumstance, a situation in my life that I need breakthrough. But it feels like an insurmountable mountain and I come to God and I start complaining to Him. English is a terrible language because we just go into our, you know, or our our mother language, whatever that is, is we know how to complain in that language. We know how to just go, God, please fix this person. Please fix that. Please change them. Please help me with this. Please give me this. Please heal me of this. Please. And we just go on. And that's, that's the first stage of prayer. It's called complaining prayer. And the Bible has an antidote for that. And it's praise because the garment of praise for the Spirit, put on the garment of praise for the Spirit of heaviness. And as we begin to praise instead of complain, complaining is what we naturally do, but praising is what we should do in the Spirit. And as we begin to praise, our way through this, we praise Him. You know, in all things, give thanks. The Bible says, for all things, give thanks. So we got to start applying the Word of God to our circumstances rather than rehearsing it. What did Pastor Ashley say this week? He thought it was really good. If you rehearse it, you curse it. Or you, I don't know, some, yeah, wow. Renee, you liked it. I'll let him know. He said, you should say that. I'm like, see, I couldn't even say it. It's just isn't not natural for me. But anyway, it's if you're rehearsing, you, you, you're actually making the mountain bigger. You're, so go, go into praise. Begin to praise Him. Praise Him for the mountain. Praise Him in the circumstance. Praise Him even though you feel heavy. Praise Him until that heaviness lifts and you feel yourself coming into the second stage of prayer. And the second stage of prayer is little little faith. And I call it the hope stage of prayer. You know, it's like hope starts to rise. Oh God, God, you may be able to actually help me here. You know, <laughs> here we just have no faith and we're like, you know, God, I'm just telling you about this problem as if He doesn't know about the problem. But here we start to feel a hope and a little bit of faith start to stir. This is the phase where we need to worship and magnify God and make Him bigger than this mountain. And we begin to worship Him. I'm telling you, if you have the language of the Spirit, change that out for English over here. If you have not been baptised in the Holy Spirit, can I encourage you, find a leader and say, pray for me. It is a gift. The Bible says it's available to all. And we have certain times in our church life where we we put on a Bible, uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit class, can I beg you to to, uh, sign up for that so that you can receive the language of the Holy Spirit because it bypasses your complaining. It shortens this stage because you're now speaking in the language of the Spirit. You have no idea. Your mind doesn't know what you're saying, but your spirit does. And God... Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit interceding on your behalf with the right words instead of the complaining words. And you get here and then you begin to worship and magnify God. And I'm still speaking in the heavenly language because it flows out of my belly like rivers of living water. And I don't have English language that's clunky and and hard to describe what I'm feeling because what I'm feeling is spiritual and my language is natural. And the two sometimes just don't blend. And so I'm speaking in my heavenly language and I'm worshipping God. And as I magnify God and worship Him, the mountain shrinks and God becomes bigger. And then all of a sudden, after you've been doing this for a while, and I honestly believe this process is about an hour long. If you do it right, suddenly you slip into 
a great faith zone. You begin declaring. You're not complaining anymore. You're not asking. You begin to declare into the spiritual realm. And when you get into this zone in prayer, you begin to shift atmospheres in the heavenlies. You begin to begin to pray the heart of God into the situations. You begin to be in a place where you can say to that mountain, be cast into the sea. You see, we hear about that, but we mostly only stay here in our prayer life and say that verse doesn't really work. It does. You just haven't got to that stage yet. You need to press in. We need to develop a prayer language that is effective, that is fervent, that is just praying God's heart into the world. You know, I remember... (laughs) A situation where this happened, it was quite a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago now, and uh, we were having some contention in our family, not between Pastor Ashley and I, but you know, those boys, they're, they're, they're Evans boys, that's all I can say. <laughs> they, they, they jostle and you know, And so there was a bit of contention in our family and that as a mother, any mother in the place, you know that that just is, I felt physically sick. It was a horrible feeling. And my friend said, do you wanna go up to my lake house? I have a lake house, you can have it free for the week. And so, you know, I bribed my kids. I'm like, right, we're all going to the lake house. Everyone needs a break. And they went up to the lake house and I was a day late or a few hours late, I can't remember, but I had to go up by myself. I'm driving in my car and I start in this. God, these stupid kids. I am so sick. They're grown, two of them are grown men. And I'm really over it. Blah, blah, blah. And I start there, right? And then I start speaking in a prayer language, in my prayer language, because I realise that the more I speak in English about the problem, the worse I feel. (laughs) And so I back off and I start speaking my heavenly language and praising God and I move to here and I start worship, I put worship on in my car and I start worshiping God and I'm still praying in my heavenly language, casting out demons out of those boys. I'm only joking. Uh, Theologically incorrect. Anyway, so I'm just like, in this stage and all of a sudden, the drive up to the lake was two hours. And all of a sudden, about an hour in, something shifted. I'm in the car by myself. I'm speaking in my heavenly prayer language at the top of my voice. And then I begin in English. You see, now I'm in this stage of praying my English is lined up with heaven. And I begin to declare what God has said in the heavenlies over my family. I begin to bind and loose and declare and I'm screaming at the top of my voice. As you can probably imagine, it's a sight to see. Um, And I literally, in the middle of all that here, Uh, and I look in my revision mirror and there's a police car. I'm the only one on the road, so I'm pretty sure it was for me. I'm like, what does he want? So in America, you pull over really quickly. I actually don't know how long he'd been there. Um, He thought he had a chase on his hand and was calling up for backup. But um, I pull over, hands on the steering wheel, wind down the window. He said, "Uh, hello, ma'am. Do you realize you were doing 90 miles an hour, which is like 150 kilometers an hour, uh, which is a super speeder in in Georgia, which means you can go to jail for that. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Anyway, (laughs) he's looking at me and I'm like, he said, do you realize you were doing over 90 miles an hour? And I'm like, no. I genuinely didn't know. I'm like, no, I am so sorry. And he gives me the whole thing. I could take you to jail right now. Uh, You know, (laughs) I'm like, Lord Jesus, help me. He goes, what were you doing? I said, you may not believe this, 
but I was, I was doing warfare prayer. <laughs> uh, he, I don't know whether he had a praying grandma or he just thought I was nuts or he did have a tiny smile at the corner. I said, I'm sorry. I got into, I've been praying and I got into warfare prayer and I guess my foot just went, you know how it is when you, you just get right into the zone. He's, he, he would have been like 25, 30 max, this guy, young guy. And I'm like, yeah, I thought, I've just got to be honest. I can't tell a lie. I'm just going to be honest. I'm just right out here in warfare prayer. I'm heading up to the lake, um, my family, and I'm, I'm kind of praying over some stuff in my family. And I am so sorry. He just gave me a polite nod. He said, ma'am, you be on your way, but can you please take your foot off the accelerator so you arrive alive? <laughs> I did not get a ticket, which in itself was an absolute miracle. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would pray for other, I, I would probably clap for other things and not the fact that your pastor committed a, an illegal offense worth, worthy of jail and you're clapping that I got off. I'm a little worried. But all praise be to God, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I want to ask you what you need to let go of to reach forward. What do you need to let go of? Because this is about being sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit so that you will become the potent church of the last days that God is going to pour out His Spirit upon and change the world. You see, the Bible says the latter rain is stronger, harder, bigger, longer than the former rain. When God pours out His Spirit, it's going to be stronger and harder than anything we have ever experienced before. And I feel like God is shouting at me from heaven, saying, I want my church to be ready. I need my church to be ready. God chooses to work through you and I, broken, imperfect individuals. But He says, I want to work through you. I want you to be sensitive to my voice. Some of you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, but you keep it to yourself. And God wants obedience and sacrifice from you to be able to speak up in an environment you know you might get criticism in. Hello, thank you so much for watching this video today. I pray this sermon has blessed you, encouraged you and inspired you. You know, we may have never met. I may not know you, but God knows you. And I tell you that God loves you today. That even before you knew about Him, He loved you and He has a plan and a purpose for your life. You know. So many of us try to do this life, leading our life in our own way, trying to look for answers and peace and joy, but we all come up short. But God knew that you needed rescuing. God knew that you were looking for more. So in order to have relationship with you, He sent His Son, Jesus, to come and connect with us, to live a life just as one of us, but to never fall short and to pay the price for the mistakes that you and I always make. You see, Jesus lived a perfect life that I could never live and you could never live. And He died in our place and took the punishment for my mistakes and rose again to life so you and I could have life. You see, I believe that when you believe in Jesus and you invite Him to be Lord of your life, you can experience the forgiveness and the peace and the hope, the joy and the purpose like you've never known before. You see, it's not about what we've done and it's not about who we are. It's just the fact that we have a God that is good that can turn things for good and loves you. See, He's a father, and He's a friend. And if you invite Him into your life today, simply by saying this prayer after me, I believe you can have the peace and the hope you're looking for. So I'm going to say this prayer and I'm going to invite you to say this prayer after me. Wherever you are watching around the world, would you join with me in this prayer? Maybe you're listening and you once knew God and you've walked away. Well, I believe God could be getting your attention today to get back into relationship with Him. Maybe you've known religion, but never a genuine, real relationship with God. Why don't you say this prayer too? And I believe this can be the beginning of a great new day for you. Let's pray. Say this after me. Dear God, thank you for loving me and giving your life for me. I pray you forgive me for my past 
and you walk with me into my tomorrow. Let me know your grace, your forgiveness, your peace, your purpose, your joy and your hope into my life. I ask you lead me and guide me from this day forward. Be Lord of who I am in Jesus name. I'm so glad you prayed that prayer today. I believe that as you did, the peace and the grace and the love of God comes into your life right where you are. You know, the past is real, but it does not have to dictate your future. Let the love and the grace and the Word of God go with you from this day forward. And I believe the best days are ahead of you. If you did pray this prayer, or if you want to know more, or maybe you're on the journey, why don't you flick us an email so we can send you some great material about following Jesus. Maybe we can connect you with a local church near you or this church if you're near one of our campuses. And I believe there you can get around good people that would love to pray with you and do life with you. I'm so glad you prayed this prayer today. I'm so glad you're on the journey of following Jesus. I'm so glad you listened today. God bless.